So, Your, your Highness, uh, last year you contributed a lot to the success of the Monaco uh, World Policy Conference, and thanks to you, uh, we made the front page, the headlines of the front page of the Wall Street Journal and the, and the New York Times. Uh, thanks to your provocative uh, answers to my provocative questions. <laughs> and uh, therefore, I think that we uh, should try to do at least as well uh, this year. So again, thank you very much for uh, uh, having accepted to have this uh, uh, dialogue uh, this time. And thank you very much to be a, a regular participant and friend to the WPC. And uh, I, uh, what, what I suggest to discuss is the broad picture of the Middle East, because uh, there are so many uh, uh, flashpoints in the, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, but it's, um, it will be interesting to have your uh, view of the, of the global picture. So why don't we start with this? Um, Monsieur de Montbrial, ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be back in Korea. Um, this morning, of course, hearing the President of Korea deliver such an important speech was very informative and equally uh, attractive for someone like me to come and hear such words of, uh, of wisdom. Um, when I was in my previous work as in the intelligence business, of course, um, agent provocateurs were always a target. So you can bet that I'm sure you are always a target to intelligence businesses. Um, as you said, um, if you ask provocative questions, you will get provocative answers. But let me start by um, mentioning three issues, of course, in the Middle East. Everybody knows them. We have terrorism. Uh, we have uh, conflict. And we have what I would say... Um, the remnants of uh, the colonial period, uh, but also new uh, developments um, that have something to do with, with uh, military intervention and uh, previous colonial practices. And of course, in terrorism, everybody talks about uh, the so-called uh, Islamic uh, state, which is neither Islamic nor a state. Uh, and uh, from the point of view of, of not just Saudi uh, uh, people, but also I think in the majority of the Muslim world, if you look at all of the surveys that I've looked at, you will see that the appeal of that um, uh, group uh, has not uh, achieved the aims that it wanted to, to achieve, which is not only to, to hijack the Muslim world, but also to create um, an area of, of confusion that would allow for the conflict to keep uh, continuing. Uh, in that uh, issue, uh, they call themselves, as you know, the Arabic acronym for, for ISIS is uh, Daesh, and uh, those who know Arabic will know that uh, I've been calling them uh, Fahish. Um, Fahish in, in Arabic is uh, a word that comes from the root word Fuhsh, uh, which means uh, literally uh, the worst of the worst. And I think we should continue to call them Fahish instead of giving them the um, the very high uh, value name of Islamic State. Uh, and that is one aspect, I think, of how we should deal with these groups, is not to allow them to take on these uh, exalted uh, descriptions that they want to show themselves as being representatives of. So in terms of, of the media and in terms of uh, propaganda, if they have had any success, it is because people have accepted that attitude that they, or that guise that they put on, on themselves. Now, let me just read you one thing, if I may, which I, I delivered in, in September 2011 
uh, in the United States to an American audience. And at that time, it was uh, September 2011, I said, uh, when it comes to difficulties facing our region, one must still admit that terrorism remains an important threat. But it is not just Al-Qaeda that continues to plot against us. There are also various emerging and re-emerging non-state actors who are moving in to take advantage of power vacuums created by shifting political dynamics. With governance in Libya, Yemen, Tunis, Egypt, and Syria in such tenuous conditions, the perfect conditions for terrorist cells to take root and conduct deep uh, and conduct desperate, evil, and anarchical acts are created. And this is exactly what has been happening with the growth of these uh, these groups. So when was that? When did you say that? September 2011. I think just before the uh, Islamic State in Iraq became the Islamic State in Iraq and, and Sham or Syria. And I think this is something that will continue to happen as long as we don't treat the, 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 the illnesses and continue to treat the symptoms. And, and definitely Fahish is a symptom. The main, the main disease in, uh, in, in that area are the failing states. Uh, if you look at uh, Iraq, for example, um, uh, after the American invasion, which completely removed government institutions in Iraq, a vacuum was created. And even after the constitution was, was set up in Iraq and uh, a government was elected, the way that the proportionate system of the division of the Islam of the Iraqi society was devised in that constitution allowed for sectarian differences to increase rather than to decrease. And so you had a very sectarian prime minister who ironically, from day one, continued to get support, not only from the United States, but from Europe and also from Iran. And it was that prime minister that eventually led to the rise in these groups uh, that have accepted not only the challenge of marginalization of a large part of Iraqi society, but also to take advantage of the m misconduct of his government when it comes to security and the capabilities of the Iraqi armed forces. Once uh, Fahish invaded uh, from Syria, um, the Iraqi army collapsed and you had the occupation of Mosul and other towns in, in Iraq. If, if you allow me to, just to... Be provocative, Monsieur de Montbrial. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not really, but how do you explain that uh, the, at least the Western governments and to my knowledge uh, most intelligence uh, systems were taken by surprise uh, and as late as uh, June uh, of this year, they, of course they knew that uh, Fash, as you say, was uh, operating, but they did not uh, measure the uh, the scale and, in particular, its, uh, the strength of its uh, organizations. How, how do, you, uh, as an intelligence, as an intelligent man and an intelligence man, how do you explain that? I don't think I can, because I, there is no reason to to uh, to fail to see how these groups will take advantage of the vacuums and how the 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 misconduct of, of the governments uh, in, uh, in Damascus and, and in Baghdad would create a situation where the, the, a big part of the population will be marginalized and will be available to be taken advantage of, of such, uh, such groups. Uh, as I mentioned in my previous uh, uh, statement, uh, from September 2011, one could discern that there is going to be a problem 
uh, that is going to grow rather than uh, to decrease. And uh, if intelligence services in the West uh, and in other places did not manage to identify this, this growing uh, threat, I think you'll have to look into their, their practices. Um, but definitely in, in our part of the world, one could see how things were, were, were coming. And even in, in, in the places the, the concerned, in Iraq, there were many people warning um, American officials and uh, other uh, officials from Europe that the conduct of the government in, in, in Baghdad was going to create this kind of, of situation. In Syria, yeah, you saw after the, the, the demonstrations that began to take place in March, uh, 2011, many European and, and even the American embassies and the ambassadors there were reporting back to their governments that the situation was going to get worse unless something was done. And yet, we continue to see that uh, the West in general, and more particularly uh, Europe and, and, and America, continuing to deal with the symptom rather than with the disease. In Iraq, the situation has changed because of the change of government. And you have a new prime minister who has offered to the Iraqi people the, op the opportunity for an inclusive government that will bring all um, shades of, of political and social makeup of, of Iraq into responsibility. So there is a right step has been taken in, uh, in Baghdad. Unfortunately, in Damascus, there seems to be a universal opinion in the West and in the East and in America that nothing can be done about the really horrible way that Bashar al-Assad has been treating his own people. More than 200,000 Syrians have been killed. The majority of them have been killed not by Fahish, or by Jabhat al-Nusra, or by other terrorist groups. The majority of them have been killed by Bashar al-Assad and his supporters. And yet, ironically, you see even European contributions to the fight against Fahish, the aircraft that are bombing Fahish, European aircraft, and other air forces coming from as far away as New Zealand and, and Australia, they're fighting Fahish in Iraq, not in Syria. Uh, for someone living in the area, it is not only confusing, but it is absolutely unbelievable. It's the same disease, the same symptoms, and yet you choose to treat one part of that, of that symptom and not the other. So not only the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but other countries like uh, Turkey, like Jordan, like uh, Gulf states in general, support the fight against Fahish. But all of them believe, and you've heard this not just from me, I am not an official, of course, but also from official uh, people. Just a few days ago, King Abdullah, uh, I think, was in, in Washington, and he made a statement that that treating with Fahish is, is not enough. You have to go to the root of the problem, which is the way that the Syrian government has been marginalizing and actually persecuting the majority of the, of the Syrian people. So what, what, what would you recommend to the problem? Uh, what, what would you recommend? And my provocative question, because there is one, is uh, don't you think that uh, uh, to, to, to find an agreement with uh, Iran uh, could or should be uh, the beginning of a possible uh, solution to restore uh, an order in, in the Middle East? Uh, and that, of course, uh, poses the question of the attitude of Saudi Arabia vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Iran. It's not just the attitude of Saudi Arabia. I would pose the question, perhaps provocatively also, if you're going to survey the opinion of, let's say, 100% of the Syrian people 
as to whether they would like to see Iran participate in finding a solution to the Syrian problem. I would suggest that the answer would be that more than 80 to 85 percent of the Syrian people would tell you that Iran is our enemy because Iran has troops on the ground in Syria killing Syrians. It has called its allies from Lebanon, from Iraq, and from other parts of the world to kill Syrians. And to invite Iran, having become, if you like, a partner in crime with the government of, of, of Damascus, would be, I think, not only unjust, but it would be a cruel and, and very callous turn of events in a world where we see so much cruelty taking place, but not as to the scale as happening in, in Syria. The kingdom has always said publicly and in private to our Iranian neighbors, you have to stop interfering in Arab affairs. And if you look at the belt from Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, there is a very strong connection between Iranian intervention in these countries and the insecurity and the instability, and in the case of both Iraq and Syria, the outright murderous attitude of people there who are supported by, by Iran. If Iran were to get out of its interference in these countries, there would be nothing to hold us back from cooperating with them. You know, in September this year, uh, our foreign minister met with the Iranian foreign minister in New York, although the kingdom has been inviting the minister to come to Riyadh since President Rouhani was elected. He has not seen the time fit to do that. Nonetheless, they met in New York, and I would assume, I was not present at the meeting, that our foreign minister told the Iranian foreign minister what the complaints of Saudi Arabia were. And I'm sure the Iranian foreign minister equally told the Saudi foreign minister what his complaints were. Hopefully, having exchanged these, these uh, ideas and, and uh, words of, of, uh, of complaint, that they can work out a formula where they can reach a reasonable outcome to this. But unless and until Iran stops killing Syrians, unless and until Iran stops supporting these militias that go and kill others, well, we see it in Iraq today. Shia militias supported by Iran are supposedly fighting against Fahish. And they go into towns in Ambar province, clear out Fahish, and then clear out the population of those towns. So it is unacceptable for not only Saudi Arabia, but I think for other countries to accept that attitude from, from Iran. And this is what the kingdom has been proposing uh, to the Iranians. So far, President Rouhani, having come in as an elected moderate representative of, uh, of Iranian society, he has said many good things in public, um, but in actual fact, Iran has continued to pursue the same attitude and the same actions in Arab countries that the previous government of Mr. Ahmadinejad did before him. And what about the other main uh, actors of the region? I am thinking of uh, Turkey, Egypt, and Israel. Israel is still an occupying country. It is a country that, that continues to maintain its colonization, if you like, of Palestine. Uh, not only with, with uh, expansion of so-called settlements, I prefer to call them colonies, um, and, but also with the way that it is treating its own population of Palestinians. Uh, we've seen the rise now in these incidents 
in, in, in Jerusalem and in other parts of, uh, of occupied territory and even so-called proper Israeli territory. How can anyone expect otherwise when a people feel oppressed and their rights not granted and uh, they, uh, they turn to violence because that is their only way that they can think of removing that oppression and that mistreatment. Nonetheless, the Arab world has presented to Israel what I would consider to be a very fair and very equitable solution. Two states, borders of 1967, with acceptable swaps and a uh, return of the refugees through, uh, co through negotiation um, and uh, removal of the hostility and the, the end of, of, of uh, uh, war uh, between not just the Arab world, but all of the Muslim world and, uh, and Israel. Not one Israeli government since that proposal was made in 2002 has accepted this proposal, even to say, okay, let us sit down and negotiate. Um, we've heard from several Israeli leaders, like Shimon Peres, for example, that there are some good things in this proposal, but none of them has come out and said, let's see what can be done about that. And I think unless and until any Israeli government uh, that is in power in, in, uh, in Israel can accept this, uh, this deal, the Arabs will, will continue to be untrusting of, uh, of, of Israeli intentions as they see the expansion of these colonies taking place in, in the West Bank. And it is for Israeli leaders to make that decision. Today I was reading in the press, for example, that the, the present, I think, Minister of Housing uh, in Israel, in, in a conference like this in, in America, uh, declared that, well, the Palestinian problem may not be resolved. So what? There are many problems in the world that have not been resolved. These are his words. And he continued to say that maybe in 40 years' time we will annex the West Bank as we already annexed Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. And this is a minister in a government that has declared it wants to negotiate a two-state solution. Now, if someone on the Palestinian side had said from Mr. Abbas's government, let's say, no, 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 you know, in, 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 in 100 years' time, we're going to drive these Israelis to, to the sea, you will see the big out, uh, you know, outcry from, from not just Israelis, but from American leaders, from European leaders, from, from everywhere. And yet nobody takes Israeli statements and, and objects to them. There is a double standard here, I think, that should be resolved by the Europeans and by the Americans. Turkey. Turkey ah, Turkey. Turkey, not you, but... Uh, yes, well, Turkey. I'm, I'm glad there is that clear, Yanni. Yani, um, Turkey is, 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 is a, an important player in our part of the world. Historically, culturally, even in terms of, of family ties. I have Turkish blood in me. Uh, my grandmother was a Circassian, and, and she was born and, and, and raised in Turkey. My mother was born uh, in, in Turkey. So um, that's the kind of relationship many Arabs have uh, with, uh, with Turkey. But the, there are problems with, with, with Turkey. Obviously, from Saudi Arabia's point of view, we think that Turkey should be very, very helpful in uh, bringing stability and peace uh, to the area. Not just on the Syrian uh, question where we and, and, and the government of Turkey agree on, on the root causes there that the removal of Bashar al-Assad is necessary to reach uh, a solution there. But on other issues, we differ with them. Uh, they still maintain a very hostile attitude to the present government of Egypt, for example. We, on the other hand, think 
that we should help the present government of Egypt because hopefully with the roadmap that was devised after the removal of the previous president uh, in, uh, in Egypt, um, there is going to be one more step to be taken by the Egyptian people, which is the election of the parliament. They've drawn up a constitution, which I think from everybody's point of view is an inclusive and quite fair constitution. Um, they've elected a president. Uh, now the next step is to elect a parliament. And I think this is the only way that you can go to reclaim the stability and, and security of the Egyptian people. Uh, and the kingdom will continue to support um, Egypt. Uh, and I think it's not just the kingdom, but even now, I think Europe and America have come around uh, to accepting this, uh, this uh, um, new factor, I think, in, in relationship with, uh, with Egypt. Uh, other than that, we have no, no problems with, with, with Turkey. Their position on Palestine has always been very good. And uh, they've tried to intervene. I remember at one time they were negotiating some kind of deal between Bashar al-Assad and the previous Israeli government back in 2008. Um, nothing came out of that, uh, unfortunately. So um, we will continue to agree with Turkey on certain issues, but I think we will disagree on others. And if we look at the... Uh external major powers, that is uh, essentially the United States, to some extent the European, the Europeans, European Union, and Russia. Do any of them have a vision about what should be done? I think the Russians do. Um, at least, if not what should be done, they have a clear vision of what should not be done, particularly in Syria. Um, but we're still talking to the Russians. Um, recently, we had a visit from the foreign minister, and our foreign minister visited uh, Russia. At the G20 meeting in Australia, recently our crown prince met with Mr. Putin. And what I read in the papers is that they discussed issues like Syria, like terrorism, etc. So maybe through these discussions, well, we can hopefully uh, make use of Russia's very strong position in, in, in Syria. As you know, they helped in bring the, bringing Geneva 1 and Geneva 2. One of the ironies of Geneva 1 and Geneva 2 is that they proposed the establishment of an interim government in both Geneva 1 and Geneva 2. Yet, when the Arab League made that proposal to the Security Council a couple of months before that, the Russians vetoed. That, that proposition. So there is some kind of, of, uh, of discrepancy there, uh, which I hope that by these engagements we have with them, that they can clarify. And I think they have uh, also questions about, about terrorism, because as you know, they have this Chechen problem and other uh, problems in, in, in Russia. And what we try to tell them is, if you solve the issues in the Middle East, these problems of the nature of violence and so on, will hopefully decrease in other places uh, as well. Because it is these awful pictures that people see, continue to see on television and YouTube and Facebook and, and other means of communications of people being killed and, and, uh, and massacred and, and so on that bring out this, uh, this violence and, and, and uh, very, very nihilistic and, and anarchical attitude from some people. Um, yes, from our communities. But it's not just our communities who are <coughs> delivering young people to Fahish. Look at how many Europeans have also joined Fahish. And how many Americans have joined Fahish. And so on. So it's a, it's a problem that affects all of us. And I think to be able to treat it in, that, in such a manner is the best way to go about it. You uh, say that you uh, agree with the uh, Turks in particular that uh, the Assad regime should be uh, overturned, but to be replaced by whom? Definitely by, uh, like what happened in Iraq, by an inclusive interim arrangement. Uh, if you look at the Arab League proposal, in, in uh, 2011, the end of 2000, 2012, it envisioned 
um, a, a government made up of the present setup. It even named Bashar al-Assad's vice president as being a representative of that uh, government in a coalition with the opposition. Uh, you know, France, Saudi Arabia, U.S., and other countries recognize the Syrian Coalition Council as being the um, legitimate representative of the Syrian people. So you can have that engaged in it. There are ways of, of bringing people in. I see that the Russians now have, are talking to the council, which is a good step, and they're talking to other people from uh, within the framework of opposition in, uh, in Syria. So the kingdom is not opposed to any formula there as long as it is inclusive. And uh, the problem with Mr. Assad, of course, is that as it is with, with the Iranians vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian people, he is the main culprit, if you like, that the Syrian people would like to see taken to the international court, uh, criminal court, as Mr. Milosevic was. Milosevic, how many people did he kill? Maybe 100,000, 150,000. Well, Mr. Assad has surpassed that, that figure and will continue to surpass it. So it is that kind of, 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 of situation where a truly inclusive uh, government in, in Syria, I think, can be the way to resolve uh, the, uh, the problems there. So last question before taking uh, a few uh, questions. Uh, well, the, if, if I try to sum up, you know, all the major powers uh, disagree in a basic way among themselves, at least on one, if not more, issues. So that cannot produce uh, a, a solution. So uh, the Europeans sometimes, you know, when they think of restoring uh, an order, or European order, the, the classical historical reference is the Vienna Congress. Uh, in, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars. So do you think it would be uh, possible to convene uh, um, a bigger uh, Geneva conference or whatever uh, involving the main uh, powers of the region, the, the main regional powers and the, the main uh, outside uh, powers, uh, which of course uh, would uh, pre, uh, uh, would assume that uh, there would at least be an agreement on the desirability to, to, to get to, to, to an agreement, which is not, even that is not sure, of course. So do, do you think what, the, what I'm saying makes sense? And if it does not make sense, which is possible, what, what would be the alternative? It seems the President of France has, has an idea like that vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian issue. Uh, we read in the papers that he, he wants to propose an international conference. On, on reaching an agreement on, on Palestine. That might be good because, as we can see in the United Nations framework, uh, that issue has been on the books for more than half a century without much achievement there. And um, we've just seen perhaps it's going to be the last effort by an American Secretary of State to try to, to bring the Palestinians and the Israelis together. Um, so a new route perhaps there for international community to do it might be a way of, of doing that. If it succeeds in Palestine, it might take on another momentum perhaps and go to other places to resolve. But I would say on, on issues like, like Syria, for example, um, I think it, it is really an issue that should be if at all possible, uh, that the Syrian people themselves can be invited to find their own solution. And you know how you can do that, because in Syria, you have the major composition of the people is the city dwellers with villages and towns that have elected their representatives from Ottoman times, they've been doing that. And even under the Ba'ath Party of Mr. Assad, they have been doing that. And you have the labor unions in, in Syria, like all so-called 
uh, socialist, uh, Arab nationalist uh, governments in, in the Arab world, they use the, so the, the, the labor unions to uh, maintain their influence and power over different uh, parts of society. You also have the tribal composition of, of Syria. Uh, we hear about how much Fahish is, is killing in, uh, in, in these tribal um, areas in, in both Syria and, and, and Iraq. And representatives of those uh, groups can be invited, if you like, to attend uh, a national um, um, a congress uh, in, a, in a neutral uh, capital. It could be anywhere in, in, in Europe or, or in Asia, perhaps in Seoul. Why not? Um, and, and let them come out with their own ideas of how Syria should go on from being the fractured state that it is now uh, for, for a solution. The coalition council can be a member of that, of that makeup and representatives even of the present uh, government in, 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 in Damascus can be, can be invited. That way you get away from, from the sensitivities and the the issues of, of who supports whom, and, and Turkey supports that, Saudi Arabia supports this, Iran supports that, uh, America does this, Russia does that. And I think that might be an idea uh, that could be made to, to, uh, to, to be, yeah, you know, brought to, to a better understanding uh, if it is worked on. Uh, and there are many people with, with brilliant minds here uh, who can perhaps be helpful in, in promoting that idea, and the World Policy Council perhaps can play a role in that. I hope so. Yes? And I hope that some brilliant minds here will bring the solution in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> but, but do you think the Sykes-Picot borders will survive in the long run? You know, everybody has, has, a, has a view of the Sykes-Picot. Um, my view is that um, if we try to change the Sykes-Picot um, borders now, where are we going to stop? Uh, and uh, just consider the Kurdish issue for a brief period. Um, we have Kurds in, in Turkey, we have Kurds in Syria, we have Kurds in, in, uh, in Iraq, we have Kurds in, in, in Iran. Um, any consideration of an independent Kurdish state will have all of these countries in conflict with the Kurds. If you take other nationalities or, or, or ethnicities in, in, these, in these countries, the Alawites, for example, in, in Syria, well, there are Alawites in Lebanon, there are Alawites in Turkey, more than the Alawites in Turkey, more than the Alawites in, in Syria. Are you going to stop only in Syria, or is it going to go on to, to, to Turkey as well, and, and so on? So maybe you can start something there. But who's going to put a stop to it? And I don't think now we have the kind of, of, of uh, either military wherewithal or perhaps moral wherewithal that perhaps the Versailles Treaty had after the end of the First World War where people accepted that borders should be done the way that, uh, that they were. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a few. Uh, Miguel, would you like to say something? Miguel Moratinos and then Riyad Tabet. He is one of the brilliant minds. Yes, this is why I'm giving <laughs> him the floor. <laughs> yes, thank you, Your Highness. Thank you, Thierry. I think you already cover whatever we can say and add tomorrow, but you, you give us some <laughs> ideas and we'll elaborate. I think uh, I fully agree with uh, His Highness about, uh, well, 100 years after sites Pico to start uh, moving to change borders uh, and drawing maps uh, could be quite difficult, no? But what is really have changed is the new Arab reality. And I think uh, my question will be how in the new world, after 100 years, well, 100 years, start the Arab nationalism and to bring up, you know, Arab state, and under the came with the Second World War, 
while the tremendous uh, tragedy of uh, the Holocaust, uh, Israel has a new state, but now is a new era. So my question, because I fully agree with your analysis, how the Arabs in this new challenge war is going to have their own say. Is no more maybe United States, of course it will be there. Maybe Korea or Japan or China, now they have their own oil concern. While the previous agreement of Saudi family with United States, all universal security, now the United States uh, they will continue to be some issue on, on energy, but maybe Japanese, Chinese, uh, Korea's ones. And what is the Arab uh, on position in this new world? Yes, please. Let me take two more sure. questions since we unfortunately will have to, uh, to stop. And uh, of course, all this is an appetizer for tomorrow's uh, discussion. And I, I hope, Your Highness, that you will uh, be there. And, and, and contribute again to the discussion. Uh, Im Sung Joon, I think that's uh, important to have uh, also an Asian view. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Tabet, next. No, no, Im Sung Joon first. Im Sung Joon first. Well, my name is Im Sung Joon, formerly served in the Korean Foreign Service, especially as Korean ambassador in Egypt. So I want to go to Egypt. Mm. Well, uh, I think uh, this is very rare opportunity for all Koreans to learn about what's happening in Middle East. Uh, thank you for yeah. your presentation. Uh, I have a short question about the general situation in Egypt or the Middle East in general. Uh, we in Korea have closely followed uh, with some hope and expectations uh, what we have, uh, uh, what have transpired in the region when Tunisian people surprised the whole world during the so-called Jasmine Revolution, a kind of popular revolt against its uh, dictatorship. Well, then uh, Tunisia was followed by Egypt's Paris Square Revolution, which ousted President Mubarak and its military government. But we saw a dramatic turn of the events uh, in Egypt last year when Muslim Brotherhood-backed Morsi government was brought down last year and a new military-backed government was launched uh, this year. What impact or implications uh, does uh, this change have over the whole region in Middle East? Does it mean that popular democratic movement in the region has nowhere to go or just came to an end. Thank you, Sumjun. Uh, Riyad Tabet from Lebanon. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Highness, I'm going to ask you a provocative question. Again. <laughs> the Montreal didn't ask. But I'm going to continue in French, if you agree. Uh, everybody That's notice that this many... Is, this is French? <laughs> well, I continue in French. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you part, uh, maybe, maybe you should try Arabic, I think. That's yes, way. If, yeah, yeah, if yeah. Arabic is uh, accepted, I'll do it, no problem. <laughs> Uh, tout le monde uh, uh, trouve qu'il y a un nombre important de djihadistes qui viennent des régions d'Europe et des États-Unis, Afrique du Nord et ailleurs. Et la question se pose pourquoi Il y a un problème réel sur le terrain. Il y a des constructions dans ces pays de, où il y a des musulmans, bien sûr, de mosquées et d'écoles coraniques. Le financement de ces écoles coraniques, où il y a aussi des enseignants qui viennent en même temps des régions de Moyen-Orient, provient des pays d'Arabie, du Golfe et d'ailleurs. L'enseignement de 
de l'islam dans ses écoles est un enseignement que je peux dire unilatéral. Se fait dans des régions où les, les étudiants ne connaissent pas l'arabe. Ils prennent, ils ne sont pas capables de voir ce qu'il y a dans, leur, dans leur, le Coran dans son ensemble. Donc, ils prennent des enseignements un petit peu une, euh, orientés et dirigés. Et il y a un genre de lavage de cerveau qui se fait, qui produit des djihadistes qui viennent au djihad en Syrie et ailleurs. Une autre question liée à celle-ci, la plupart passent par, les, euh, par la Turquie. Et vous avez dit que vous avez de bonnes relations avec la Turquie. Pouvez-vous aussi nous dire quel est le but de la Turquie de favoriser ces infiltrations, à part le fait de vouloir euh, euh, que le départ de Assad Il y a d'autres objectifs stratégiques de la Turquie dans la région, si vous pouvez nous le dire. Bon, Je merci, vous remercie. Merci, Harry. Riyad. Uh, I'm not going to speak Arabic this time. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, Prince Turkey Al Faisal speaks very good French, but uh, maybe he will choose to, not to have understood part of your question. But <laughs> I, I, I hope he will choose to have understood the question. So uh, I, I suggest, Your Highness, that you answer now, because uh, unfortunately uh, time is, uh, is exhausted. So, but, but, but please answer, because these questions are very important. But, Mr. Moratinos, um, you probably know the situation more and better than, than even I, I think. But your question is important. And I think for us in the Middle East to be able to, to treat with these important issues, there has to be an Arab opinion. Uh, unfortunately, the mechanism for that, the, the Arab League, for many years has not provided that, uh, that needed um, uh, mechanism uh, for us. Uh, but uh, I would say that when you take the Arab League actions during the, 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 the turmoil that has taken place in, in Libya, in, uh, in, in Syria, uh, and uh, in, in Yemen, um, but there has been an, an Arab League um, uh, contribution to uh, to those uh, to those uh, problems and positive contributions uh, and, and in Syria for example i mentioned the the arab league interim government proposal that unfortunately the russians and the chinese uh, vetoed uh, in yemen as you see the situation now in turmoil there with the houthis again a very um, destabilizing a group that unfortunately has also the support of, uh, of Iran. But the Arab League and the United Nations are still playing a role of trying to bring um, stability to, uh, to Yemen. But on the whole, I would say that the Arab world does need a, a, a new uh, mechanism uh, that, can, uh, that can contribute more forcefully, if you like, in, in the affairs of, of the region. Uh, the, the GCC countries themselves have not hesitated to be the, the, the instigator of, of Arab League action when it came to Libya, for example, when it comes to, to Syria uh, and uh, in, in the Yemen. And I think a coalition between the GCC and other important Arab countries Um, like Egypt, hopefully, when it stabilizes and has more ability to be active uh, in, in the area, like Jordan, a uh, very important country uh, in, in the area. Morocco uh, is all, also a very important country in, in, in that context. Um, and perhaps other countries can join uh, this coalition. Maybe that will have an impact on the wider uh, situation. But I would say, if I may, if we start by, as the, the, the Chinese ambassador this morning said, the situation is not that difficult or complicated on some issues, but it is simple. And for me, 
starting with, with the Palestinian issue, would be the simplest way of beginning to solve the problems in, in the area, because everybody knows what the solution is. Um, it's a two-state solution, as I said, based on the 67 borders with swaps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is lacking there is simply the political will. And if the world community is willing to put the pressure on both sides to achieve that political will, I think this is what we can start with and go from there to solve other, uh, other issues. I always tell my, my, my Israeli acquaintances and my, and my Jewish friends, once this problem is resolved, you know, with, with, with Jewish and Israeli money and Arab brains, we can go a long way in fixing the rest of the, uh, of the world. Um, so that is one proposition I think we can, we can do. The other issue that you asked, sir, about Egypt. Definitely Egypt is, is, is a missing um, piece of the puzzle that can be very helpful in reaching all of these uh, problems. Well, just look at the last problem we had in Gaza. Even with Egypt's constrained ability to do things, if it wasn't for Egypt, uh, there would not have been a ceasefire. Uh, between the Israelis and, and, and uh, Hamas in, in Gaza. Uh, so its ability to do things is borne out by that very important uh, accomplishment that they managed to, to bring about. Uh, and the kingdom, of course, as I said, will continue to, to help uh, Egypt. But, but that's not enough. It's up to the Egyptian people themselves to you know, pull up the, the, the bootstraps, as, as they say, and, and do the, the necessary issues. President Sisi, I think, was very brave in, 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 in proposing these very important uh, subsidy cuts on, on energy uh, in Egypt. Imagine, this is something that has been going on for the last half century, since the, the revolution, 1952, um, yet no leader, not Nasser, with all of his popularity, Sadat and, and Mubarak and so on, were able to do and take that step, and yet he did. And the Egyptian people accepted it. Um, that is very important, and it shows a sense of responsibility, not just on the part of the president, but more importantly, on the part of the Egyptian people who are willing to undertake that added hardship on, on, their, uh, on their lives. But there's always, you know, when such popular uprisings take place anywhere, the momentum for a period of time in any country, even in, even in Tunisia, Tunisia is not yet a firm um, base for, for, from which uh, the, the Tunisian people can reach uh, stability. It's still a work in progress. These uprisings will take their time until they settle down and new developments uh, take place, and Egypt is going through that difficult period. I don't have a particular solution for Egypt, but it is the Egyptians who will, who will find the, that solution, and they proved for the last 6,000 years, Yanni, Egypt as a country has been known as, um, as an identity, as, as a border, um, as a, 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 a geographic and ge geostrategic location, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And its contributions to humanity are uh, countless. Uh, so I have no, no. Uh, I'm not pessimistic about Egypt. I think they will come out and do the right thing. But first, they have to establish stability. And unless and until they do that, no country can go forward uh, from there. As to our friend from Lebanon, last time in, in Monte Carlo, he also asked another provocative question. <laughs> So maybe he is the agent provocateur more than you. Um, yes, jihadism is, is an issue. It's an issue with all of us. And as I said, Yanni, it is not just the Arabian Peninsula that produces jihadis. Uh, we've seen that, that, that uh, if you like, that epidemic spreading uh, worldwide from Europe, from America, from China, from Russia, even from Japan. And, and I don't know if there are any Koreans involved. I hope not. But... It, it's a universal issue. And I would say that these schools that you mentioned, particularly in, in Africa, 
I've heard the accusation that Saudi Arabia particularly has given money and, and sent uh, teachers and so on. And I've always asked people who make that accusation, do you have a name, a bank account number, uh, a telephone number, a postal address, any indication where the authorities in Saudi Arabia can then follow whoever has done that, and we have proven that we do that after particularly September 11th in, in, in America. We worked with the Americans, we worked with the Europeans, we worked with the United Nations, and so if there are these accusations, I think they have to be backed up by, uh, by facts that can be treated with soberly uh, and, and, and neutrally uh, and effectively. Um, but just simply to say that Saudi Arabia or other Gulf states support these schools and so on without identifying which schools, which persons, and so on, is not enough. The kingdom is willing to undertake whatever is necessary because look who are the victims of these people who go in the name of the jihad. Saudi Arabia is a victim. And to think that Saudi money will go from Saudi Arabia to these jihadis in order to come back and, and make Saudi Arabia a victim, I think is beyond my comprehension. And added to that is the fact that we have taken action against these jihadis. Just today in the press, the kingdom just arrested something like 120 people inside Saudi Arabia, nearly a third of them from other countries in the area, from Syria, from Iraq, from um, East Africa, and so on. So just tell us who these people are, where they are, and the kingdom will, will do what is necessary. But to simply throw accusations, whether at the kingdom or at other uh, GCC countries, I think, is not enough. And, you, and I'll be happy to sit down with you, and if you have any addresses and so on, please give them to me. Okay, so Riyadh, if you, if you have those uh, addresses, telephone numbers, uh, please do it bilaterally <laughs> with Prince Turkey Al Faisal. And then so, the question will arise how come he knows these addresses? And these <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, uh, Your Highness, as always, this has been a fascinating well, thank you. Dis discussion. Thank you very much. So tomorrow we will uh, continue the discussion in the Middle East in a different way. Uh, by the way, uh, one of the speakers uh, will be also uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the advisor, the, the counselor of the King of uh, Morocco on oh, yes, foreign Martin, affairs. Yes. And since you, you mentioned also uh, the importance of Morocco, I think this is uh, uh, quite interesting. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, we will discuss, well, you will discuss with Riyadh <laughs> about uh, the accounts, and we will discuss together how the WPC could uh, contribute <laughs> to improving the, the, the situation in the Middle East. Why not? So now we are going to have a very, you are running behind schedule, but so we are going to have a very brief coffee break. Uh, especially as the cocktails uh, will be served uh, immediately after uh, the, the, the next session, which is quite uh, important uh, too on, uh, on, on Africa. And since tonight the Minister of Foreign Affairs is uh, coming uh, for us, I, I think we should not be late to, 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 to move to the third floor uh, after that. So, Your Highness, thank you very much again. May, may I just say one thing? Yes, yes, yes. yes wait, 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 may wait. I just say, wait. we say in Arabic, Khamsa Hamida. So, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>